it turns out it's an implication of Hamilton's theory of inclusive fitness that there will be um, many situations in which the participants disagree about circumstances when altruism and restraint from selfishness are appropriate. And that's what we will now attempt to unpack. For example, your mother is expected under a wide range of circumstances to prefer that you would be nicer to your little brother or sister than you want to be. Why is that? From your mom's evolutionary genetic point of view, your offspring are as valuable to her as your brothers are, and vice versa. She will be related to them as grandchildren in either case, and barring inbreeding, her relatedness to grandchildren, whether through you or through your sibling, will be um, one quarter, 0.25. However, as you see it, your own offspring are worth twice as much to you because you're related to them by a half, as are your brothers, to whom you're related by a quarter. They're um, your nephews and nieces, like with my nieces, related to them by a quarter, whereas um, to your own offspring by a half. Therefore, you are predicted under the theory of inclusive fitness, um, to be ready to be altruistic to your brother only when the benefit to him is greater than twice the cost to you, that factor of two being the ratio of your relatedness to brother's offspring relative to yours. And that is a fair comparison because they are both members of the same generation. But mom's fitness will be increased whenever the um, altruism is efficient. So whenever the benefit to your brother, let's say, again, in units of expected future offspring, whenever the benefit to your brother is greater than the cost to you, mom's total expected inclusive fitness goes up, right? That's, that's an efficient um, exchange. Yeah, it hurt me, but it helped you more. Mom's happy, but you are not necessarily happy. She would um, likewise prefer that you refrain from being selfish to your sibling whenever the cost to the sibling exceeds the benefit to you, but you certainly didn't see it that way. Um, you're willing to be selfish whenever the cost is less than twice as great as the benefit to yourself. So these kinds of conflicts are, in theory, um, irreconcilable conflicts of interest. That is, there's, there's no easy um, negotiated solution where everyone will go, oh yeah, that's fine. Okay, fascinating theory. How can we test it? It turns out, studying the sex ratios of ants provides one of the best um, ways to do this that's ever been discovered. So we have to take a brief detour here into the theory of sex allocation, as it's called, that is the evolutionary um, um, hypothesis for sex ratios. And the principle is that the rarer sex will, under almost all circumstances, be the fitter sex on average. Why is that? Because every offspring has a mother and a father. This is easiest to appreciate and most consistently true for outbreeding bisexual species like most animals and a certain number of plants. Thus, the total fitness, because every offspring has a mother and a father, the total fitness of all the females must equal the total fitness of all the males. You meditate that on, on that um, statement for a few minutes or even seconds, I think you'll see that that must be true because everyone has exactly one mother and exactly one father. Okay, it follows from that 
that the members of the rarer sex at mating time are going to be fitter. Fitness being inversely or negatively uh, frequency dependent. And this graph on the right shows that. It shows fitness on the y-axis um, as a function of the population sex ratio um, here um, represented as the proportion males. It is sometimes written the other way around or in other forms entirely, um, but the, this oldest convention is that a sex ratio of one would be 100% males. A sex ratio of zero would be 100% females. 0. 0.5 is 50-50, um, which is so familiar to us from nature because, according to this theory, that's the point and the only point where the fitness of a male is equal to the fitness of a female. Um, on average, which is to say that from the point of view of parents, investing in sons is going to be, on average, expected to be equally profitable to investing in daughters. Okay, so here's an important example for the sex ratios of social insects. When the sex ratio is 1 to 3, male to female, that would be 25% males, 75% females, all right, one to three, or if you like, three to one, then the fitness ratio will be three to one, um, males to females, right, because there's only a third as many males as females. Each of them gets, on average, three times as many offspring as does a female. Okay, it follows then that parents that overproduce the rarer sex, if there is a rarer sex, will have more grand offspring. And using grandchildren as the measure of fitness, which is a very reasonable measure of fitness, um, that implies that there's a well-defined, a very sharp um, evolutionary equilibrium for the population, which is equal investment over the population as a whole in males and females. This um, sex allocation strategy is good for individuals, or at least unbeatable, um, and for genes, but it's not a benefit to the species as a whole. Um, remember, as we've pointed out before, males in most species, not ours, but in most species, males are useless or worse ecologically. Um, and so for most species of animals and plants, the species would clearly be better off with a strongly female biased sex ratio. That is, the species could have a larger population um, and enjoy all the benefits that having a larger population entails if it would just make fewer males. But according to this theory, the reason almost no species manage to do that is that there is such strong selection um, to invest in the rarer sex. So once males become rarer, they become more valuable genetically and um, the, the uh, equilibrium is quickly um, achieved under selection. Okay, in ants, um, remember, they have altruism. These, all these workers who are functionally sterile and often literally so, um, sisters rear their siblings. Um, who are virtual offspring with an average relatedness to them of one half. The queen is equally related to her sons and daughters, r equals a half, um, but workers are three times as related to their reproductive sisters as to their brothers in the haplodiploid hymenoptera um, if the queen mates only once. And, um, this, we need to emphasize this um, logic works for ants and other social hymenoptera because the entire insect order hymenoptera is haplodiploid, meaning males arise from unfertilized eggs laid by their diploid mom. So they are haploid as if they were a living sperm. Um, they have only one chromosome um, of each kind, whereas um, sisters are have both a father and a mother in the usual way and are fully diploid. Okay, so mom's related by a half to both of them, but the sisters are related to their um, uh, 
full Civ sisters by three quarters, because they all have not just the same father, but the same father's genome, because he had only one. Um, it follows, then, um, that workers would increase their indirect fitness by investing more of the colony's resources in female than in male reproductives, because genetically, um, the female reproductives, their sisters, their reproductive sisters, are more um, valuable to them than is a brother, and by a ratio of three to one. So, given that um, genetic asymmetry, the uh, equilibrium sex ratio from the worker's point of view would be a population sex ratio of investment of three to one female to male investment. At that point, the workers would gain equal fitness from working an hour on behalf of female reproduct reproductives as they would for working an hour on behalf of male reproductives, their brothers. But at this sex ratio, queens are, as it were, unhappy because they would benefit hugely by inducing their colonies to invest more or entirely in males. Right, let's recycle the equilibrium from the point of view of the worker ants is that the population sex ratio should be strongly female biased, three to one among the reproductives, the winged ants, in males, this is a male, and in females, there actually isn't a reproductive female up here, but, but this is a queen, I believe, minor workers, yes, and for, yes, this is a queen, here, so this is a former, this is a former reproductive winged ant who's lost her wings, which they break off once they fly, right? So the, we we're talking about the sex ratio of the reproductives produced by a colony, um, not including the workers who, being non-reproductive, aren't part of this calculation. Okay, so the conflict is the queens want 50-50 um, ratio of investment in males and females, the workers, as it were, want a, a three to one female biased ratio of investment. Who wins? It turns out, on average, the workers win. Bob Trivers and Hope Hare, um, in a classic study published in 1976, um, estimated the average ratio of investment in female reproductives for 21 species of ants that had just one queen per colony, and so therefore at least possibly satisfied all the other assumptions of that argument on the previous slide. And here's their great figure, which shows the um, sex ratio as males over females on the y-axis for each species. There are 21 dots here, each um, corresponding to a different species. Okay, as a function on the x-axis, of the dry weight ratio of individual females to individual males in essentially all of the species, I think actually every single one, yes, the, um, the virgin queens are substantially larger than the male reproductives, and so they cost more to the colony, and this um, scaling by weight ratio um, accounts for variability among the species in the relative cost of making a female reproductive relative to a male. Whoops, sorry. Um, so um, the, the punchline is that in every case, the ratio was greater than one to one. This is the line of equal investment in males and females, where the sex ratio is the inverse of the um, well, or in this, in these units, is the same as the weight ratio. But um, in fact, um, the um, real data average three to one, um, which is the ratio predicted if workers are in control. It certainly did. Um, the, the ratios did vary a lot for a variety of reasons, some of which were small sample sizes and so on, and much of it may be real. There could be variation in the real costs of producing um, 
male and female reproductives that are not captured in the weight ratio and so on. But it is remarkable that on average, they were uh, very close to the ratio predicted if the daughters, the workers, um, win this irreconcilable battle um, for control of the sex ratio. And none of the 21 um, were on or to the left of the line expected if the queens in the species were in control. So to summarize, um, phenotypes are social in this technical sense when they affect the fitnesses of conspecific recipients as well as that of the actor who expresses the phenotype. Um, when one effect is positive, a benefit, B, and the other is negative, a cost, C, the net effect on the actor's inclusive fitness is determined by little r, the coefficient of relatedness between the actor and the recipient. Altruism is favored when C is less than B times R. Restraint from selfishness is favored when B is less than C times R. And traditionally, um, we view this as a trade-off between direct fitness and indirect fitness. But parental care of offspring um, can be viewed as a special case of kin-selected altruism, where relatedness is high, uh, in most cases R is a half, the benefit um, to the parent of helping the offspring is huge, and the cost to the parent is relatively modest. Actors in a social system um, may have, as we saw in the case of the sex ratios of monogynous ants, that is single queen um, colony ants, um, may have irreconcilably different interests. And this can be true um, for non-social um, insects as well, as we discussed with uh, um, conflicts between siblings and parents within a conventional nuclear family like ours. Um, sex allocations in ants show that conflicts between offspring and parents may at least sometimes be won by the offspring. And that's not so surprising in the case of ants, where the workers hugely outnumber the queen in most species um, and do all the work. Um, so the queen really um, has no way um, to uh, force the workers to do her bidding, except to um, trick them, which presumably would not be um, very evolutionarily stable since they would be selected to figure out a way to resist the queen's manipulation. All right, um, see you next time.